So I, they, they don't let me use the gavel when we have uh, workshop meetings. So it's like as much as I want to like pick it up. And so this is a workshop meeting. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we will do a quick roll call. Uh, and I think I see everyone here. Is anyone missing? Speak up. Uh, no, nope, full, full roll. We're all here. Uh, and I see the city administrator, and I believe Nick Ward Willis is online. Good, good, good evening. Hey, Nick, how are you? Welcome back. Thank you. Yep. Um, so our first item is uh, something with the Beacon Historical Society, and um, today uh, happens to be the 110th anniversary of the city of Beacon, so I have a proclamation here, and we have Denise Van Buren here with us. So um, Denise is the president of the Beacon Historical Society. She's also spent uh, dozens of years with the uh, uh, DAR, your former yes. national past president. For former national president down in Washington, D.C. of uh, 190,000 member organization. And, yes. And I uh, first um, uh, met Denise when she was a council member when I had moved to Beacon in 1992. And she did two years in Ward 1 at a particularly Correct. important time. I think the, the 90s We were, were building this building and yeah. Yeah, there was a lot going on in terms of trying to repoint the city at the time, so. Yeah. I was the very first, first ward council person because we'd been the commission form of government prior to that, oh, wow. so. Um, do you want the proclamation or do you want Why don't we before? save that for the big finale? Okay. Is that all right with you, That's sir? That's perfectly fine. Okay. I'm very bossy. You know that from uh, all those I years well ago. Aware. So today, May the 15th, Beacon, our city is celebrating its Deca Centennial. And yes, that is what you call a 110th anniversary. And I'm could, grateful. Could you repeat that again? Deca, D-E-C-A, ah, centennial, centennial, a Deca Centennial. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to tell you a little bit of what I'm calling the creation story of the city of Beacon. And as council members, I think that you will all particularly appreciate the kind of give and take, the back and forth, the posturing, and the policy making in Albany that went into the creation of the city of Beacon. And it might remind some of you of that famous statement by Otto von Bismarck mark regarding the unification of Germany laws are like sausages it is better not to see them being made and I know you deal with that kind of reality every day here so I hope that all of you are already familiar with the fact that we were two distinct villages Matawan, a thriving manufacturing center that was centered, focused on the Fishkill Creek, which provided all the power for those mills and Fishkill Landing here on this end of town a vibrant Hudson River Port, one of the most active in the Hudson River. The latter village, Fishke Landing, was incorporated as a village in 1866, and two decades later, in 1886, the village of Matawan was formally incorporated. But the first street meetings were held as early as 1864, right when those villages were being incorporated with the idea of forming one much larger village to consolidate services, to be more efficient, to provide a larger identity for the people who lived here. Though those start right after the Civil War, it isn't until 1910 that the city fathers at the time appoint a formal commission and they get to work. In addition to selecting the novel and ultimately, as we know now, inefficient commissioner form of government, we were the first commissioner form of government in the state of New York, the charter committee of 60 residents had to wrestle with a name for the new city. And that is where the real trouble begins. First, they chose, anyone want to guess? Saloon City. That was one that comes up later on, but they chose Melzinga, which was a Native American word associated with our place here. You, you know, we have Poughkeepsie and you know, Kaksaki, other places along the river chose Native American words. Believed at the time, but maybe apocryphal to mean running water. The second choice of this charter commission in 1910 was Mount Beacon. Tyaronda was next, and Duchess City uh, also collected a few votes. But when word of the chosen name, Melzinga, leaked out, the response statewide was not positive. Hard to spell, hard to pronounce, and hard to even look at was the general consensus. The Charter Committee was willing to compromise, they said. They'll drop the H on the end of Melzinga. So any fool could easily spell and pronounce Melzinga. They sent that new charter and the new city name to the state legislature for approval. So when the first approvals go up, it's for the city of Melzinga. Well, when that choice, with or without the H, became public knowledge, the press had a field day. According to the Wappinger's Chronicle, quote, Melzinga may sound well to the Fishkill Matawanite, but to the outside world it has the flavor of the Arabian Nights, mixed with a nightmare dream after a feast of Welsh rarebit mince pie, cream cake, and hard cider. 
From the Albany Times Union and the state capitol, Malzinga does not strike us as a good name for the new Fishkill Matawan merger. It's ugly enough to frighten little children. There seems to be as much reason for naming the new city Melzinga as for baptizing a baby Beelzebub. And finally, from the Highland Post, the charter for a new city of Melzinga was presented to the legislature Wednesday by Assemblyman Myron Smith. It was referred to to the city's committee in the legislature. Originally, the name was spelled Melzinga. It will be noted that the H was dropped. Better to drop the rest of the word and keep the H. Not surprisingly, in its first official business, the committee would vote again on another name for the new city after all that criticism. But Malzinga still had 36 first and second place votes, followed by Mount Beacon with 29. Beacon City, Duchess City placed third and fourth respectively. They sent it back to the state legislature with the name Malzinga. The name, however, was not the only struggle. It took nearly three years of political maneuvering in Albany and two veto votes by two different governors to make our city a reality. That didn't happen until May 15th, and it was signed by the governor of New York on May the 16th. We had a, a city attorney at the time, James G. Meyer, one of the lawyers instrumental in getting the charter even before the state legislature, trying to get them to consider it. And he told the story of how it took that third time to get it over the, the finish line with the third governor. In 1958, so decades after the city was formed in 1913, 1958, he was talking to the Beacon Kiwanis, and this is what he told them. It was my job to get that charter adopted in Albany. I got it passed by the assembly and the Senate in good shape, but Charles Evan Hughes, who was the governor in 1910, vetoed it. Later on, John Alden Dix became governor. He had appointed me to the prison commission and several other boards. I thought I stood pretty well with him and that the charter would have clear sailing with him. I remember coming down from Albany that day. The legislature passed it. The bill had gone directly to the governor. I thought our city had a new charter. But the first thing I heard when I got off the train was that Governor Dix had also vetoed it. We kept making changes to meet all criticisms, and we tried again. And on the third time, the bill was passed by the legislature, and it went to William Solcer. I can take credit only for getting the measure through the legislature. It was John T. Cronin, our then commissioner of safety, who had come to Beacon in the meantime. Turns out he was a friend of Governor Zulser. Though Mr. Through Mr. Cronin, the governor signed the charter bill, and Beacon did become that first commission form of government in the state of New York. The first citywide election was held June the 17th, 1913. Remember, we're just signed into law. May 15th, so it's very short, featuring uh, two different parties, the Citizens Party versus the Union Parties, very brief but very spirited. The new community's electorate really actually got involved. About 2,016 people from those two former twin villages registered to vote. They had a combined population at the time of just about 12,000, so a very high turnout to register to vote. 96% of them actually turned out for the election, and the Citizens Party candidates were elected with wide margins over the Union Party counterparts. With the governor's signature and the leaders elected, Beacon's newly elected city council would meet for the very first time on July the 1st. And promptly at 9 o'clock that morning, our city was formally, legally, and officially born. At that hour, the Honorable James A. Frost, newly elected as the mayor, opened the first session of the Council of Commissioners in the large assembly room on top of the Mays Hook and Ladder building. July the 1st, the first meeting, right? Believe it or not, the first order of business was to act on a petition presented by Reverend A. Toop and William E. Verplank with 200 signatures calling for the community to vote on the city's new name. So they were still Melzinga at this time. Such a vote was conducted, and Beacon, who was eventually decided upon. In that public referendum, Saloon City was one of the write-in votes that some little jokesters who like to frequent nice establishments had included. So City Hall would be set up a few doors away from today's Howland Cultural Center, and a half century later, the Victorian home of a dentist, a man named Carl Gurney, was purchased at 425 Main Street. They bought it then for $25,000 in 1963. It was kind of right in front of the Manabret homestead, if you can picture that. The city then spent about a quarter of a million dollars, and Beacon City Hall, which of course is now in private ownership, was erected on that site. That city hall at 427 Main Street was formally dedicated June the 13th, 1964 by the current mayor at the time, Stanley O'Dell, and there were past mayors in attendance and a large, a large crowd turned out for that. This current city hall was dedicated in 1996 during the administration of Clara Lou Gould, and it was designed by a Beaconite. 
Kathleen McElduff Lyons. This site was chosen after a popular referendum defeated the original proposal to place it in Memorial Park on the site of the dog. The dog park, exactly. Um, there was a public referendum again, just like there had been for the name, just like there had been to form the city in the first place, and that's how this building ends up here. So, now what would a birthday party be without a gift? So, it's a joy for me to present to our, our wonderful mayor a copy of uh, this book, which contains a lot of the information that I just shared with you and more than a thousand photographs and stories. If you want to just bring it right up to Lee. <laughs> And then, of course, we have to have some cupcakes, right? Because you can't have a birthday party without some kind of celebration. <laughs> you see, once you're in my family, I put you to work doing just about everything. So this is my son, Brett, and his girlfriend, Fiona. Brett is named after the Madam Brett Homestead here in Beacon. Oh. <sighs> So I want to just conclude with an invitation for all of you to join our historical society or support us in any way that you'd like to support us. We, um, I think, did we miss the mayor? Oh, that's one for him. Very, we don't want to miss the mayor. He's trying to get two, I think. Oh. <laughs> so, and the, these are actually um, homemade by a woman who was from Glenham, just outside of Beacon. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the creation story of the city, but also I hope that I've awakened in you an interest in the city of Beacon and its history. It's a fascinating place, the site of one of the longest running ferries in American history, the eighth wonder of the world. Um, Generations Which of is Beacon Nights. The eighth wonder of the world is. Oh, I just assume everyone knows that. The Mount Beacon Incline Railway, yep. right? Um, and we just hope to share the great story of this history with all the wonderful new people who have come and are making it an even better, even more diverse place. And um, what makes it special is everything that went before us. And that's why we're so committed to the Historical Society and its mission. We're located at the former uh, St. Joachim's Rectory at 61 Leonard Street. Membership is about $25 a year. And you get, this is my commercial message. You get uh, a newsletter and uh, uh, invitations to our meetings and special events. And we're just happy to share Beacon's history. And I will close by saying if there's ever anything you would like to research in your wards or in the city, um, sometimes constituents may come to you with questions about their homes or businesses that were here, and we're more than happy to do our best to research them. Wow. And Bravo. Okay. <laughs> that was great. Um, and there's an opening this weekend. Yes, exactly. Thank you, sir. Talk about a commercial message. That was a good segue. Uh, we are opening this weekend on Saturday. We're open from 1 to 3. We have a new exhibit called The Great Estates of Beacon. Twelve of the Great Estates are prominently featured. Sites like Roseneath and Wodeneath that are gone, um, but also some that are still here. The Manabert Homestead, the Christie House, Eustatia. Uh, some of these amazing um, estates that were built here by people who recognize the really unique physical beauty of this space. Even Robert Jewett, who is aboard Henry Hudson's Half Moon when the, when the boat stop, stops here, says this would be a good place to build a town upon. We're at the foot of Mount Beacon, at the gateway to the, the beautiful Hudson Highlands on the Hudson River. Um, these folks recognize this beautiful setting, and we had many major estates here by prominent people, and this is what this exhibit celebrates. And then we're looking forward to the fall when our emphasis will be on urban renewal and the changes that it meant on this side of town in particular. And we're talking with a lot of the displaced families from um, African American, from Italian American, from many of the families that were here on this end of town who lost their homes and livelihoods as a result of urban renewal. So we're doing a lot of really exciting things there. We are all volunteers and doing the best we can, so we're happy to help however we can, but we have limitations. So. All right. Thank you, sir. So um, one comment, and then i got to read a proclamation. So the dog park was the site of multiple attempts to build things. Uh, uh, for a, a while, it was trying house? to take things off Main Street. So that was City Hall. Yes. And then also the library. Mm -hmm. We had to do a referendum yes. there, which also failed, uh, to move off Main Street. And then I think one of the fire studies was looking at the central station uh, up there, too. Absolutely. Um, and then ultimately, you know, the dog part is such uh, such a great resource. But um, that's how this building ended up here. And it was built here because well, we were committed to the concept of a T intersection. Now, I don't want to take up more than my fair share of time here. But, you know, our waterfront, like every other Hudson River waterfront, you used to come up Main Street and come all the way up Main Street from the waterfront, cut right through this parcel and continue on Main Street. And then you followed it up around the bend in today's East End. And you would have continued what we know as the green fuel or green you know, green fan economizer, maybe you know it as the Talix property. It 
continued right through there and took you up and out to Fishkill. It was one long continu contiguous Main Street. Well, Urban Renewal chopped up both those ends. It chopped off this part of Main Street, and it, um, through work with Greenfield Economizer, who wanted to stop the traffic through there, traffic is now diverted on Blackburn and goes up and out Fishkill. But think about what that natural flow was like. Every other waterfront, you're on Kingston and Poughkeepsie. We had the same kind of Main Street. But this parcel, in particular, after Urban Renewal had sat for a long time and had not been developed, and we decided with the critical T intersection and the fact that you could see the river from here that this was the preferable site. And I was honored in 1996 in November to serve as the MC for the ceremony when we dedicated it. So in my mind, I think of it as being just sparkly brand new. <laughs> so I have a proclamation in honor of the 110th anniversary of the City of Beacon, whereas the City of Beacon was formed on May 15, 1913, through the merger of the two conjoined villages of Fishkill Landing, established in 1866, and Matawan, established in 1886. And whereas the newly formed city became the first commission form of government in New York State, a system that was replaced with a strong mayor and city council in 1992, whereas the city was a beacon was named in honor of the Revolutionary War signals built atop Mount Beacon, and whereas, uh, and I will read it in its entirety, the city of Beacon became known as the hat capital of New York State, with hat production second nationally only to Danbury, Connecticut, and produced scores of products including rubber tires, locomotives, leather jackets, boxes, textiles, baby carriages, insecticides, blankets, and industrial fans. And whereas the city of Beacon is featured in one of the longest running ferry systems in the United States, hosted one of the early, earliest trolley lines in the Hudson River Valley, and housed the world famous Mount Beacon Incline Railway, which was billed as the eighth wonder of the world and the world's steepest funicular. And whereas the city has become a thriving center for arts and culture due in part to the arrival of the world-class Dia Beacon Art Museum in 2003. And whereas the city of Beacon can claim famous leaders, athletes, entertainers, and artists, <coughs> including Robert Montgomery, James Forrestal, Emilio Bettina, Digger Phelps, and Lenny Torres Jr. And whereas the Architectural Digest has declared Beacon uh, one of the 15 most beautiful main streets in America, and whereas today, May 15th, 2023, marks the 110th anniversary of the City of Beacon, now be it resolved, that all who live in or visit Beacon join in honoring this significant milestone, which marks 110 years of prosperity and community for the city born of two villages on May 15th, 1913. Signed by myself, Lee Kiriakou Mayor, on today, the 15th, the anniversary date. So Thank can you. I present this to you? Please, I would be honored. Thank you. Attention. Welcome. And um, one little trivia next year. It's also my birthday. Oh, awesome. Yeah, happy birthday. Have a great meeting. I sat in those seats literally. Yeah. <laughs> they, they probably are the they, same seats. They are seats. the same seats, yeah. uh, actually. And you feel it. Thanks for the cupcakes. Good night. Thanks, yeah, good thanks again. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you all for that. I that appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And I, I keep learning things every time I hear Denise. So. Uh, so the next item is the appointment of Jennifer McGuire to the position of account <laughs> clerk typist. Chris, you're going to tell us something about that, and I'm going to eat my cupcake. Yeah. Or at least the frosting. Good luck getting that open. Uh. Um, so this position is the um, employee who works at our, our front desk and receives people, um, our account clerk, typist uh, resigned about four weeks ago. We've interviewed several rounds of people and uh, Susan Tucker has recommended Jennifer McGuire, who is actually a Beacon resident, to take this position. Um, there was, typically there's a civil service list that we have to draw from. There was one or two names on that list, so we're allowed to quote unquote break the list. So you don't have to use that list if it's under three people. Um, so she'll be appointed provisionally and we'll have to take the account clerk typist uh, civil service exam when it comes up again. And we would hire her immediately. <laughs> we, we're really short-handed right now. Questions, comments? I 
do whatever Susan Tucker says. You're That's w- actually kind of true. <laughs> I'm still um, waiting on my chicken permit from eight years ago. They, they cashed the check for $15, but I never got the permit, so I'll bring it up to her. Your um, chicken permit, huh? <laughs> Is the chicken permit issued by the city clerk? I don't know. Never got it. I don't know. All right. We'll have to figure this out. Chicken permit. I have illegal chickens. Well, they cash the check. I would say that. I was just making a small... Yeah. I didn't even know we had permits for chickens. I, you're, yes. We do. Yes, yes. absolutely. Do. Wow. Well, I... The things I learned. And in the, in the <laughs> interim... Uh, who we've, who have we had ca- covering the front window? It's been Heidi and Nick. Um, and Heidi Harrison, we borrowed from Recreation for a little while. Ben is filled in. Susan Tucker filled in. Paula Becker. Um, so we've had a lot of help. Yeah. Amanda Caputo at times. All right. Well, we're getting there. Okay. Um, hearing nothing else on that one, let's move on. We want to talk about the fire station bid results and how we want to proceed. And Chris, you're going to take us through that. You've got a lot more information now than you did before. Yeah, and I'm I'm going to share my screen, um, Mayor. I have a little presentation to do. That should be shifting to full screen in a moment. Maybe not. I'm sorry, there's a delay because it's not. Ben, do you have this and can you put it up? Absolutely, one moment please. The the wireless is uh, slow. Um, So I'll I'll just jump in. Um, The firehouse project, I was going to give a little bit of background for people just tuning in. the, the consolidation of our three firehouses to one firehouse started with studies back in 2006. And we've moved incrementally through a series of, of studies and then design work and location studies to figure out how to get to one central firehouse. Um, so uh, about two years ago, we started talking to the council about this, saying, hey, do you want to move forward on making the uh, the existing fire station across the street at Lewis Tompkins Hose, the consolidated site. Um, And then, oh, thank you, Ben. Um, This is a a rendering of what the building is going to look like, and I'll I'll walk you through a little bit about what the changes are, um, and then um, give you an update on the bids that we just received. Next slide, Ben, please. Um, so again, for people just tuning in to this, why are we doing the project? Um, again, we're trying to consolidate from previously three fire stations to two to one. Um, all three of our historic fire stations, um, this one is the least historic, but again, they're, they're not suited to the apparatus today and to the new demands of a paid professional department. So in in redoing the building, we looked to do a number of things. One was to reorient the building so the the front of it is actually on Walcott Avenue. When it was built, it was faced towards um, South Avenue. So everybody driving through 9D through our community sees the back of a building that's not particularly architecturally interesting. And South Avenue was the old 9D before they built the arterial. Right. So it faced the right way once. Yes. So we're going to turn it around to face what's now the um, thoroughfare of the city. The existing facility is about 10,000 square feet. We're going to do a complete gut rehab. That ended up being actually more than we originally anticipated when we started talking to the council two years ago. It's going to basically go down to the steel beams and the slab, and everything else is new. And then on the north end by the visitor center, so. This new section, if you can, oh, Ben, can you show the new section with your pointer? Yeah, to the left. That's the new section, which is going to be on the north side of the property. We're going from the current three bay system, which all um, empty out onto South Avenue, to five bays, where the three primary bays come out onto Wolcott Avenue. And then we have two backup bays going on to south, where we'll have 
our ambulance, or possibly our fly car, um, or, or perhaps a backup apparatus. Um, the building uh, was designed in, and built in the 80s. It wasn't particularly energy efficient, so the new building will have, um, will be, have high insulation values, be airtight, have heat recovery systems in the air handling systems, and utilize a geothermal heat pump system. And those um, wells are going to be drilled in the gravel parking lot, which will then be paved and made a 50-plus car parking lot with charger stations and um, newly planted trees where we've taken out the trees along Walcott Avenue. Um, the fire station is, is going to be a, a stately looking real brick building so that it lasts 100 years. Um, and that did add a lot of cost having real brick. Um, but again, when we came to the council with our architect Bob Mitchell about two years ago, there was pretty, pretty good consensus that let's, let's build a building that's going to last and it's going to look like something um, that would have been built 100 years ago. Um, and again, this will serve as a consolidated single fire station after which Maze Hook and Ladder on our main street would be decommissioned and perhaps reused. Um, ben, next slide, please. So we, st we started working on the project. The photo that you see was during the hazmat um, asbestos abatement. We had about $132,000 of asbestos abatement to do, and that uh, finished up pretty much within 30 days. Um, we went out to bid for the project, and I'll talk about the seven primes that we used. So it was broken down. Under New York state law, you don't just have one contractor, but you have multiple prime contractors. Our bids were received on May 1st, and we had a really good return. We had 27 bid results for the seven trades, and I'll go through those in a moment. What we're looking to do is um, get the authorization from you to do the seven bid awards for these seven primes next week, along with an ancillary contract for independent materials testing. And we hope to begin mobilization the week of the 6th, um, and then construction in the following week. So they would basically make a construction site on the existing um, parking lot and begin to dig out rock on the north side where we have to level that hillside to build the building in. Uh, we think it's going to be a 14-month project, so we're hoping completion by around Labor Day 2024. Next slide, please. Um, so in the bidding process, it, it's broken down by, um, you, you're required to break it down by four or five trades. We, we ended up breaking it down into seven trades because we thought we could get cost advantages on certain items. Uh, as I'll go through that. So the general contractor, we had seven proposals. In, in the italics and in your memos is the low bidder, which is Mid-Hudson Construction Management Incorporated. You'll also notice that they won the package for the site work, and that's a good thing. Having the GC and the site work done by the same firm, which is a good, reputable firm, um, helps with a lot of the logistics of coordinating between the trades. Mechanical, which is also HVAC, known as HVAC, we had five proposals. MDS HVAC R Incorporated was the low bidder. Plumbing, we had five proposals. SNO Construction Services won that bid. Electrical, we had four proposals. RLJ Electric Corporation had the low bid. Fire sprinkler, um, there was only one proposal, but there's really only one company in the region that does this. So w the reason we broke this out is because if we put this in the general contractor or the plumbing um, contracts, they would have just gone and done a contract with this company and then added their overhead and profit on top of that. Similarly, with the geothermal wells, there were, um, actually, this is wrong. We had two proposals, um, and Connecticut Wells, which had dug our test wells some time ago, had the low bid on that. And then again, the site work is the same as the GC, and we had three proposals for that. Overall, this was a really good response, and I think this was driven in part by us hiring the Palumbo Group as our construction management firm. We initially weren't going to go with that model, and we're going to do a clerk of the works. And we really got good value by doing a construction management firm that has 
very strong networks with the people that bid these. Um, and again, we're also going to be bringing to you, and you'll see on your agenda, a proposal to hire tectonic engineering consultants for independent materials testing. So when we do things like pour concrete, they're going to take test samples of that to make sure that it meets the specs um, of the architect. Um, and again, we um, didn't have to go to bid for that, but we did get four proposals, and they were the most cost effective. Um, so the next actions, Ben, can we go to the next, uh, there we go. So the next actions we're going to be asking you to take is to award bids for the seven prime contractors. Um, even though the one has two um, parts of this, they'll have separate contracts for each one. Um, to authorize the agreement with tectonic engineering consultants for the independent testing. Um, when we bring the capital program to you, which we're going to present um, at the May 22nd meeting and then talk about in June and July, um, we're going to be asking you to increase the capital program for $4 million. Um, and again, we, we previously bonded for $10.47 million based on estimates more than two years ago. Um, this is definitely going up. Every, everything is going up in this industry, and then we made certain choices like sticking with the geothermal, which added half a million dollars. Now, that puts a lot more money up front, but over the lifespan of this building, we will save that in energy. Um, and again, we think we can um, fund that $4 million out of fund balance without hitting the bond. Um, I also talked to Susan Tucker about um, using bands, um, which are uh, short-term lending instruments, um, for the first years so that we can try to pay down the 10.47 before we go to a long-term bond. And this would be a 30-year bond. Um, and then one of the other actions we may bring to you, and I'm assessing it with the Traffic Safety Board next week, is to pass a local law making South Avenue one way only um, from Main Street to Beacon Street. And the purpose of that is we're going to be closing the parking lot, and St. Andrew's Church depends on that parking lot, and they don't have enough parking for their Sunday services and funerals and weddings and other, other things. We think we can get about 50 spots on the street if we make that one lane, two lanes of parking on both sides of the street, and one way. And then we can see what, what Nick and I discussed is having a law that sunsets in 18 months, so it, then it would revert back. Um, and again, we may find that we like it, and then we can leave it. But I want to vet this further with our police and fire um, and traffic safety folks before uh, we steam ahead on that. Can you also involve the school district in that, as South Avenue School is right there? I don't know if the buses use that. I'm, I'm just curious if they have any thoughts or want any opinions yeah, we, about that. We can reach out to them. Thank you. And then, Ben, the final slide, please. Um, so again, I, I'm looking forward to this project mo moving forward, because I think what we're doing is, is we're really upgrading a key entrance to the city as well. When the architects came and they looked at this building and we started going through iterations of what the brick could look like, their, their first designs weren't very impressive. And we sent them to go up and down Main Street and look at the old fire stations and look at the older buildings and figure out how to make this look like it could have been built in the 1880s or 1890s as opposed to today. I think what you're going to have on the outside is that with a modern fire station in, in the inside. This modern station is finally going to be ADA compliant. We're, we're going to have, instead of four bedrooms, six bedrooms that actually comply with some of the fire regulations. Um, we're going to have a decontamination area entering the building from, from the base so that people don't take this dirty gear into clean areas of the building and we can properly clean and store that. Um, and it also is going to give us operational improvements. Instead of having two firefighters in one location and two in another, the four and sometimes now five on a shift will be all there at the same time and able to train. And part of the facility has a clear story where they can train um, with ladders and ropes. Um, so I, I, I think, again, this is a long time coming. This community has been working on this for at least 17 years. The price was less than a third of what it would have been today if we had done this in 2006. 
But again, I, I'm not sure you would have had the same product at that time. I don't know if the geothermal wells would have been far enough along to do that. And I don't know that Beacon would have been in the financial situation it is today to be able to do a stately, beautiful building. I mean, this is really in a large part being paid for by the new sales tax agreement. Um, so any, any questions on that? And Ben, we can take that down. But I love that photo. It just... Um, don't you like the, the one on the left? It's kind of nostalgic. I, I do. It makes me nostalgic for the back of a cow doors. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and it served its function. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, that building was, was a, a tremendous asset to the, to the city for, for decades. And it had a really nice space for the volunteers to have their events. And, and that made more sense when you had an all-volunteer force. What we need today is something that meets all of the new fire standards and is more flexible for the future. So we built in extra bedrooms. We built in swing spaces and um, hopefully have, have designed a building that in 100 years people will say, well, that was a good investment. I have a question. Yes. Um, Palumbo suggested, uh, I believe it was Palumbo, um, uh, $250,000 contingency. Is that included in the $4 million? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, we, we're pretty good on contingencies. We have allowances built in all, into all of the seven contracts. Then on top of that, I have a contingency for things like the furniture, fixture, and equipment, the FF&E, and other incidental things that will come up. Um, and this includes all of the soft costs. So we ended up, you know, we had to pay for um, drilling to test to see if the wells would go. We actually ended up having to pay quite a bit for the engineering of, around the roadway because DOT owns that part of Route 9D and we're having to go through a whole permit process with them. So again, some of those unanticipated things that came up are now included in that price. So I'm, it, it's a pretty solid cost. And as, as to the extent we can, we'll bring it down. Like if we don't have as much rock to remove, we end up saving money on, on the, the contracts. I have a couple questions about the, the funding. Um, so two questions. First is, can you talk a little more about these micro um, bonds, uh, these smaller uh -huh. bonds that you uh -huh. described, and how they relate to the bonds that we've already done? Yes. And then also um, the $4 million, how does that relate to the total fund balance, and is that only taken over one year or two years? Okay, those are great questions. So the, the, the term of art for these is bands. They're bond anticipation notes, and they're a short-term um, financing instrument up to five years. Bonds typically are for the life of the useful asset. So in this case, because it's such a substantial brick building and it's, it's essentially new construction on the old site, they would be 30-year bonds. And what we can do with the bands is you, you renew them every year and it allows you to pay down the principal of that, which you can't do once you take the bond out. Like once you, once you finance this under a bond, you're locked into a schedule of repayment and only certain bonds allow repayment early. Um, it's not like your mortgage where you can say, I got an extra 50 bucks, I'll, I'll put that in and it'll save me on interest. Um, so these bands allow us to pay down a little bit of that um, and also wait for a time where the bond market might be more advantageous for us to jump in. You'll recall we, we did um, a bond release maybe 18 months ago when the rates were very low. Well, right now those rates have ticked up and they're getting close to 4% for a 30-year bond, even with our good bond rating. Um, what we would be looking for is, is a time when, when the outlook is, is better for us to go out and bond long-term. And by that time, we're hopefully paying down parts of it. Now, your second question was about the use of the $4 million of fund balance. That, that is only a portion of our fund balance, so it, leave, it still leaves us with $9 million in our fund balance, which is a healthy fund balance. Susan, knowing that this project has um, been, been coming down the pike, has been very cautious about spending and trying to build that fund balance each year a little bit. Um, so we, we think we can do that $4 million expenditure um, and, and again, it would be paid out from a cash point of view over the next year. So it would be both in this fiscal year and next fiscal year. 
Yeah, the only other things I'd add is bands are, because they're short-term debt, are at a lower rate, right? And as a result, you can pay a lower rate, plus you can pay it off, right? And so that is one way to kind of get you there. Um, so I would just add that. And it also gives you flexibility. Like on a band, the first year, all you do, you can just pay interest alone and not principal. There's a target number, too, that the state controller puts out for fund balances, <coughs> and we're in the range, mm -hmm. so uh, after the $4 million. And that contrasts, as you know, with the other city in, in the county who had a, a negative fund balance. So we've been in the right direction, and um, someone said, um, I do whatever Susan Tucker says. It's usually the correct answer. So. I thought the, the fund balance that we had was, uh, was related to our credit rating as well. So is, taking $4 million down won't affect our credit rating? It, as long as you stay in that range, right? Because what they're looking for is a fund balance relative to the size of your budget. So it's, right. a, it's a ratio. And as long as you're in that range, I think you're in good shape. So that, that's our impression. Yeah, and Susan was comfortable with it. And she talks to our bond you know, folks, the Raiders, a fair bit. I would also add um, just a couple of things to what Chris said. When uh, I got in, you know, and George has been around and um, Dan do a, you know, a shorter period, we've been you know, kicking this uh, firehouse can down the road for a long time. One of the insistences that I had was, um, one, it needs to be at Tompkins, and the studies, one of the studies that said it was you can't do it at Tompkins, and it's like, yeah, okay. Um, and then the other one was get it down to its absolute minimum. And, and it turns out, once you got it to its absolute minimum, guess what? You could do it at Tompkins, right? And so the original, which was probably half the price, no, um, less than half the price of a full build out of the old plans, was uh, an extra bay facing South Ave. And I thought, that'll work. I, I got no problem with that. And then since then, the second thing I've kind of said is I'm okay to expand past the minimum, but you got to show me what it is and why we want to do it. And so the first big one that occurred was saying, um, if we don't do five bays facing uh, 90, because that was the original, and we only did three, um, we could do that, and then we wouldn't need to face South Ave, right? We could face the new 9D. That added a fair bit, um, and we've added some things since then that still, um, put a renovated building at a much lesser cost than new construction and land acquisition, and two, give us, I think, much better value. So I'm sort of willing to kind of allow it to go above the minimum up into this range, simply because it, it made sense. And then the third thing was, okay, let's find the financing, which has been a combination of watching our fund balance and then negotiating the sales tax revenue. It's not all going to that. You remember we put it in several different buckets, including kind of saving some of it, but it's a good piece of that. So. And then um, I'm reminded by Nick that um, with the one-way street change, um, in order to effectuate that by the time the construction begins, we, we might need to set a public hearing next week. So I would appreciate um, you allowing me to put that on last minute. On Thursday, I'll be vetting this with the Traffic Safety Committee um, prior to the meeting. And then I'll also reach out to South Avenue's principal and, and see if they have any operational issues. If I don't hear any concerns, I'd like to set the public hearing so that we could actually get this going in, in June because um, then we would need to stripe the parking spaces and we'd like to not close the lot before we can um, ensure that St. Andrews has some, some you know, substitute parking. So Chris, one thing, um, the Traffic Safety Committee will be meeting on the 25th, so that would still be before the public hearing and I could certainly provide a memo to the council before the public hearing if you wanted to set it next week. Great, thank you. Um, and the proposal would be to um, start those 18 months in the first week of June? Yeah, that's, okay. uh, again, uh, we're going to start fencing stuff off in that, those first weeks of June, so. Okay. Um, and, and again, we can, we can, I'm open to it. We, we have time yet to formulate the plan on it. The, the early idea was to do a sunset, because it's just easy. It's like, okay, in 18 months we know we're going to be done. If you wanted to leave it in place, we could also just make a, um, a leave a process in to reassess it and see how it worked. Because it does give us more parking in that area of the city as well. Have we used that approach to get more parking elsewhere? Does anyone know? 
Most of the streets, think about it, heading into Maine are one way. Are one way. So we, we've sort of either in or out. That. South Ave was sort of the exception because it was 9D. That was never thought through, right? Which way would it be proposed, or is that part of what's going to be discussed? We, we were going to propose it from Main Street towards Beacon Street, so heading southward. Because if you do it the other way, you're not allowed to make the left turn. And then people right. will inevitably, they, they get up there, they're, they're not going to make a right and then do the right thing. They're going to go left and they're going to jam up the intersection. Yeah. So the idea was, um, you know, just do that one block, not go all the way to the school. Keep it two-way for the rest of South Avenue, all the way to Wolcott, but just make that one block one way. And again, it is an interesting way to think about managing your parking. If you have a street that doesn't, ha you know, like that probably wouldn't work for certain busier streets. But on South Avenue, based on what we, what I see, you know, just being in close proximity to it and being out walking in the morning and afternoon, um, you know, it'd be an interesting thing to try and see if we can pick up parking by, by doing that. We thought we could get 50, Mickey thought 54 spots if we striped that properly. On both sides, again, you know. I'm also wondering about, I don't know if, if we've, we've done, we, we have other streets, North Cedar is an example of this, where we only allow parking on part of it on Sundays because of church parking. Um, and so I don't know if there's a model where we also might want to consider variation where it's not every day that we allow that. I don't, I don't know what the need is generally. Yeah, so it's, it's not just well. Sundays. It's also when they have major life events, like they have a funeral, they have um, a, a baptism, um, they have a food pantry, food pantry that operates several days a week, so there are volunteers that are coming into that. We're actually trying to figure out an accommodation where they can come through the construction area to get to the bottom of their building for purposes of delivering and picking up for that Saturday food pantry. Um, you know, I'm still working through the details on that. We'll need proper insurance. Um, but again, for, for a lot of the things that they're doing, They've said to us, you know, we can't lose all of that parking at one time. Um, I have a just general question. Are there any other significant contracts of more than $100,000 that have yet to been brought to us related to the firehouse? I'm not, I'm trying to piece together the pieces from today to the total budget and making sure I'm not missing anything. So the, the contracts that you've approved to date that are of some size, the architectural contract is large and multi-phase. Um, the construction management contract with the Palumbo Group exceeded 300,000, so that's large. Um, we, we did a hazmat remediation with United Safety for 132000 and then everything else kind of falls off pretty steeply after that. We've done small, um, mon you know, air monitoring by Quest. We've done the Connecticut, Connecticut Wells drilling a well here or there. Um, the temporary quarters? Say The temporary quarters? Or the higher Yeah, we, I mean, that's, that's a rounding error on this. Yeah. We, we did, um, we have a trailer over at DPW for two of the firefighters so that they can stay there at night because um, we didn't have enough bedroom space at Maze Hook and Ladder. You know, so there, there's been some small cost. Um, these these seven contracts are the are the big part of the of the contract. Um, the independent testing is a small amount. I didn't really want to give that out because I don't want to tell them how much I have for independent testing. But it's under our bid amount, which will give you, you know what that is. Um, and then, um, you know, we'll have some purchases that we're going to make with the new fire chief. One of the reasons I wanted to hire Chief Tom Lucchese is because he's been actually a clerk of the works for projects, and we have about a quarter million dollars of furniture, fixtures, and equipment that will need to be ordered and arranged for installation. Um, so that's a big piece, too. Yeah, related to that is the sort of rough labor 
day time 2024 is that opening or is that the construction is finished and then things like the equipment and the furnishings can go into it before it's fully ready to be operational so September 2024 will be substantial completion um, there's still probably will be some punch list items you know um, at the end of the project we'll be bringing back the memorials that we took out from um, along South Avenue we wanted to make sure that those weren't broken during construction so our crews actually took them apart and put them in a safe place and they'll bring them back similarly I think we're going to have some long lead items so there will be things coming into the building kind of towards the end we're a little bit worried about the long lead times on electrical equipment and we're having to upgrade the electrical equipment because the whole load of the building the heating and hot water is moving from natural gas to electricity there's there's some new components that need to go in um, to where the electricity comes into the building and and that I'm told there's some long lead items some of the larger washers and dryers those might have to get installed a little bit after we open so once we get this going um, Tom Lucchese is going to be working with me on the logistics of planning those things to show up at the right time to be installed so it's a lot of it's going to be a lot of work and I fortunately hired the right chief to do it and Gary still has a hand in it Gary actually went through every item on that list and approved it and and worked with the architect to say no I need this not not that <clears throat> Chris does the uh, Palumbo group do they remain um, on site and they're the ones in charge of coordinating all these separate contractors yeah so that's a great question the the role of the construction management firm is to be the agent for us day to day they will have a trailer that's going to be installed um, as early as next week by the visitor station um, on, on the south side of the visitor center and they will be on site every work day they will have the plans in their office they will host the meetings with the seven, six prime contractors they will coordinate the scheduling they will um, they will figure out what the billing is you know again this was a lump sum bid for most of the trades with a couple uh, items that were called out like the rock so if we exceed the rock we pay more if we have less rock we pay less but generally they'll come to an agreement on what these quantities are and how much of the work's been done then they'll submit the pay apps. so they'll be on site for the 14 months the architect will then be available for construction administration so if there are questions that come up about the plan Mitchell architects Mitchell Architect Associates will be will remain involved until the end of the project both the architect and the construction manager have to sign off on all of the pay applications from all of the primes and, that, and so the Palumbo group is they're getting 300,000 did you say was there approximately yeah keep keep going and but I'll find out so that represents a total payment over the course of the project as opposed to a percentage of the job of the 14 million it's the same. They, they bill us on a monthly basis based on a 14 month project so we've they build us somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty three thousand dollars for pre-bid services mm -hmm. which they were involved in every part of it when we did a page turn with the architect and went through every detail of these pages they were there all day here they have gone through all of the plans they they were the ones who suggested initially that we not have the fire fighters stay in part of the building while we were fixing the other part of the building I I now that we're far enough along um, that was probably one of the best decisions we made to cut costs um, and and so I think I think it was about 33,000 for that first phase and then uh, maybe 330 for mm -hmm. for the rest of it you guys approve that contract um, and I'm just I'll give you a number in a second here does the state ever offer um, assistance to municipalities like grants for pre-development costs or any of those kinds of yeah we looked we we've already applied for and received a fifty thousand dollar grant thanks to Senator Scoofus so when he thought the district was going to be his he lined up a bunch of grants and then when he didn't have the district we said could we just keep this one and he let us 
Um, we've, we're looking into nisertive incentives related to the geothermal right now. Um, and I have to find out once we get the contractor on board if they can get the necessary certification to um, be able to tap into those. You have to be certified for NYSERDA, which I'm told is mostly just documentation and paperwork. So we're looking through that avenue. Um, th I've had uh, our climate smart coordinator and our engineer look at different alternatives to talk and talk to the Hudson Valley Regional Council, which administers a lot of those, and we haven't found a lot of others. I haven't called, you know, I had seen news about New Pulse's firehouse being green and receiving a lot of money, and when I called them, they said, yeah, we didn't get a lot of money. We got $45,000, and it cost us 30000 just to comply with the grant. Um, so um, we, we haven't had a lot of success on that. I thought at some point, if we come back and do a solar roof, that's also a good kind of member item for an, you know, our, our member of the assembly, because um, it's a discrete, identifiable project that doesn't just get lost in a huge project. Um, and I'm going to give you that number for. At some point, I'm going to give you this number, George. Okay. I think I found it. Um. Palumbo Group was okay, so it was thirty-seven thousand one twenty for pre, uh, pre-construction services, helping to get the bid set up. Um, the CI is $336,732. It, it, it seems like it's a great deal what we're getting in a way because a general contractor, if they would bid the whole job, they would probably hope to make a you know, 10, 15% profit. This represents approximately two or 3% of the entire job. Yeah, I think it add, the other thing is that when the projects can become unnecessarily expensive when one or more of the trades don't deliver on their part. Um, this team knows how to manage those pieces so that they are nipping at their heels constantly to get it done. Because um, if you can't you know, put up sheetrock because the plumber didn't put the pipe in in a timely manner, that's where you hit cost overruns, lawsuits, um, and again, they've worked with all of these companies, so they know what to expect. That's correct. Um, Have we ever discussed um, doing MWBE programs in Beacon, where similar to like the state contracts, um, we're bidding out to minority or women-owned businesses for subcontracting? So what, I, what you're talking about is minority and women business enterprise which is um, a program to award a certain percentage of a job to designated MWBE firms in the state. And there's a similar one, DBE for federal. When we do federal grants, like when we um, did the bump outs, there were set asides for that to be DBE. For instance, when we do Fishkill Teller Avenue, I have to have a certain percentage of an M or a WBE in the construction inspection. Because this didn't have state grants, We've never imposed an MWBE, um, and I'm not, I, I haven't heard any conversation about that since I became administrator. I do know that <clears throat> the state increased their, they tried to increase their MWBE for certain contracts. They, when I started doing projects, some of it was 10 or 15 percent, then it went to 30, and they were trying to go to 50. And for some trades, um, it, it, you didn't, didn't have availability of contractors. Like, we had seven people bid the GC. I'm not sure how many of them would have been able to comply with that. Yeah. Um, so, Chris, I mean, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I guess I'd just like to know what you know about what are the big kind of unknowns and variables that remain, things that could suddenly drive cost, probably materials, I'm guessing, because they're kind of fluctuating. But what else do you have in mind, and how do you think we would cover that cost if, if, there, if it went up even farther? So the, the risk that I see in the project, um, the number one is the long lead times on, on certain supplies. Uh, we know that the supply chains are still disrupted. They're getting better on certain things like metal, but like I've heard the electrical um, components are, are difficult. Um, the amount of rock that we hit when we, we, we did try to quantify and reduce our risk on that. You'll see 
one of the reasons we closed that lot prematurely is we did test wells so we could understand what the, the kind of triangle that we're cutting against the hillside, how much rock is in there. Um, what we've tried to do is build it so that if it is more, we have a reasonable unit price when it goes over. And then um, the way that we did that is if it's under, they lose the same amount per uh, cubic yard that they don't take out. So they, they couldn't gouge us on that. Um, I, th I think timing is going to be a challenge. Uh, you have, um, we, ha we had timing issues even with the design because one of the subcontractors had a death in the family and it put us back a month. Um, we have, so again, I, I think we might have a little bit of time overruns. We have built in healthy contingencies, so I think um, that, that helps us a lot. And then, again, we can manage as, as it goes. If I know we're in trouble in three months, I'll come back and let you know and we'll, um, we, we are fortunate to have a, a very robust, healthy fund balance right now. Um, I'm also managing projects in a different way, like I'm trying to slow down on other projects that aren't, you know, that don't need to be done immediately. For instance, we were going to redo the locker rooms and the wastewater treatment plant. I've put that on hold. We slowed down the reconstruction of the Milzinga Dam because it didn't need to be done this year. It could be done next year. So we're, we're also being cautious with these other major capital projects um, and, and slowing down so that we don't get ourselves into a cash flow issue as well. Thank you. Yeah. And, and again, rebidding Fishkill Teller in the fall and starting it next year is, is the silver lining to that cloud of having the high bid. Other questions, folks? Okay. I'd love to get access to these images that you have in the PowerPoint to help popularize the idea. I can, I'll send those around. Thanks. Yeah. Tells a story for sure. Mm. Yeah. So um, for next week, you've got seven bids and uh, an eighth. Yeah, and so you will have eight resolutions related to the firehouse and then setting the public hearing for, for South that. Avenue if that looks like it's not... Um, you know, undoable for some reason. Okay. Everyone good? All right. All right. Uh, the next item is about tectonic. Oh, this is all for the fire station. Yeah, project. I think we, we... We just covered that. Yeah, we hit this. Okay. Um, so, John Clark, are you, are you online? Sorry, I had a question about tectonic. Was there a total amount for them? I saw their per unit price, but I didn't see the total amount. Did I miss it? There's not. So it no. is just how, as we need these services, that's yes. kind of how it works. Yes. We have an estimate of what it is and have built that into the budget. Right. You okay, but we yes, don't want to tell them what that yep, is. Yep, yep. Okay. With you now. Because um, then all of a sudden we're going to have to test a lot more stuff. I also saw they have a pending new certification with the National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program, um, which to provide construction material testing. Is that something we should be concerned about, or is that just natural, like they have to re-accredit every couple years and it happens to just fall when they're bidding on this, so? I, I don't know the answer to that. The, I, I do know that I worked with Tectonic on a project about 10 years ago, and um, Tom and Jose, who work on Palumbo Group, have worked with them on multiple projects, and, and they wouldn't have suggested them unless they were uh, fully compliant. Great. And they worked with us in our highway building, it looks like, in, the, in their list of projects yeah. that they've worked on before. Okay, great. Thank you. And, th and they're one of the easier to work with. Some, some of them are, you know, the timeliness of some of these tests is important, too. Like, hey, I need you to get here these days. And they've been pretty flexible with our construction management team. And you do have John Clark on. All right. <clears throat> so I've got um, Nick and John. You know, I um, deferred to you all on terms of how you wanted to, to work this, so I'm going to hand it over to either one of you to kind of lead this, if that's all right. I think Nick was working on the yep. memo, from, so maybe yep. Nick can lead. Sure. 
That's fine. Good, good evening. Uh, so we've included in your agenda packet a decision tree memorandum that we had discussed conceptually at the last workshop, but which we were not able to get included into your packet. So we updated it to reflect some of the discussions we had at that meeting two weeks ago on May 1st, and then provided you with the questions and then a general discussion. And I think the way to proceed on this issue, unless the council has other um, thoughts, is to just go through these uh, various seven, I think, questions that we've outlined, nine questions, and get your thoughts and see where that discussion uh, takes us. And John and I will sort of present this to, together, I believe. John, feel free to jump in and add commentary as appropriate. Uh, so hearing no objections, we'll proceed in that way. The first question is, in what zoning district should a senior affordable housing development be permitted? And you know, we, we started this discussion with senior affordable housing, and I do know one of the issues is making it a general affordable housing as well that will come up during our discussion, but I'm gonna at least tailor my comments initially towards senior affordable housing, which is presently an overlay zoning district. And the question before the council is on page two of the, of the first point is, does the council wish to make a senior affordable housing development as a permitted use in all zoning districts or continue to make it a floating zone, which means someone would have to come to the council and ask for permission to have their property um, rezoned to apply that floating zone. And so it's either permitted use or continue as a overlay zone. And the additional options were if you're going to make it a permitted use, then make it a permitted use in all districts, except for the WP, the HI, and the R1 district, or allowed as a special permit in the R1 district. And then John has also suggested we've added to this memo from what we discussed last time that you could also limit in an R1 district to parcels within a thousand foot of walking distance from major transit routes such as Route 9, Main Street, or Fishkill Teller Avenue. So the first question is with this senior affordable housing do you want it to maintain as a, an overlay district or apply in as a permitted use in various districts um nick do we have can we do both <laughs> so meaning in maybe like our central main street district uh and maybe some of the other dense districts it's as of right and then in the r1 we make it special use so that the council has to review it you 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 could, yes. You could make it as of right in certain districts and in other districts where you've said it, you've mapped and said it's permitted use, but you need to come to the council to get a special use permit. I'm, I'm open to that. That's, that's what I think is best. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about having it as of right for the whole city because not every street is the same in Beacon and um, and I, and I feel like we could uh, create situations with terrible congestion. This is my issue with ADUs, too, is having unintended consequences on the congestion and safety of the streets. Yeah, I think I would agree with I think um, also we, uh, these things could be revisited as time goes on, correct, Nick? I mean, if we that is correct. You always have the ability to, to amend it. <clears throat> Yeah, I would tend to be a little bit more cautious and in places closer to, um, you know, more commercial activity and um, transportation opportunities. Yeah, I think the the R1 is an, an interesting question. Um, most of the city is, in terms of the land area, is R1. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if R1 is the right way to limit that because um, some R1, I mean, I live on 9D and I'm in R1. Right? So, yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't proposing R1. I was just using it as an example yeah. for my question. Right. Yeah. So I think we'd have to kind of dig in to kind of how to make that work. Um, the other thing that we talked about was also a minimum lot size as a way of sort of, um, kind of not um, enabling this in um, kind of smaller er you know, areas with smaller lots. And that might be another approach as well. Um, I lean away from special use permits simply because um, it just uh, creates roadblocks for construction and kind of the new thinking is to not have those roadblocks. Um, so maybe there's a way to, to, to think through what's the issue as opposed to require it to come to council for that. Uh, the other option would be to give it to planning board to do uh, with criteria, right? 
that reminds me, I think I need a refresher on the premise, if John or Nick can remind me. So the, I think the premise is that there's just been one of these requested, and therefore that indicates that there's a problem with our policies, that it's keeping um, senior housing from being built. And I think you, you told us, if you could repeat, if you still have it at the ready, how much time that adds to a developer's process if they have to come to council first. And then, so just a refresher, and then I don't think that we've asked, has there ever been a situation where we've, where we've known that, that a developer has said, no, I'm not going to do that in Beacon because it takes too long? So I, I can't answer that last question. Um, I don't have those discussions that would either perhaps John or the planning board or, um, or the building department. As to the underlying premise, this arose out of a discussion about uh, increasing the availability of affordable housing. And one of the areas identified by John and, and his number of, uh, of items was of making the senior affordable housing overlay district more available, noting that it's only being used once for a particular project, the Highlands Hospital redevelopment, and noting that by offering the increased density by allowing more dwelling units than would be permitted for um, traditional uses within the permitted uses allowed in a district, you would be encouraging developers to develop this segment of affordable housing for seniors. And it will currently, to apply this, it's an overlay district, meaning one has to file an application to petition to the city council to have their property rezoned. That necessarily has to go to the planning board, both the county and the city planning board for a report and recommendation, and then comes back to the county, to the city planning board for a public hearing. The city council also has to, under the current provision, issue a special use permit, which requires referral and a special and a public hearing, which could be done at the same time. And then once the property is rezoned and has its special permit from the um, city council, they have to go back to the planning board for site plan approval. Also add in there the overlay of secret of the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Typically your planning board has been the secret lead agency. So an applicant would come to the city council for the rezoning special permit during that process go to the planning board for a report and recommendation planning board would also make a secret determination so you'd be there for a couple of months and then once this, the secret determination is made it comes back to the city council for a public hearing and then the city council would make a vote on the zoning the special permit and then it goes back to the planning board for a public hearing on the site plan approval so by making it a permitted use and not requiring a special use permit from the council so making it what's called an as of right use where one just needs to go to the planning board for site plan john jump in but probably saves you in the neighborhood of four to six months and and some expense as well from associated with preparing plans copying those plans distributing it things of that nature and it gets rid of some uncertainty as well so it gives a developer the knowledge that the council doesn't have that discretion. The council has already determined this is a, an appropriate use in the zoning district, so it's more likely than not that the project would get approved subject to site plan approval. And there have been, yeah, the Pisco Creek Development District has a similar, it's not a special permit, but it's a concept plan before the council. And that has added significant time, for instance, on the Groveville site that's currently before the planning board that was it went to the council now it's been referred to the planning board as that's taken at least six months and it's not out of the planning board yet going back to the council for another a public hearing then back to the planning board for a site plan so it does uh, deter people from putting in applications if they're faced with a year process sort of minimum uh, to get a project through and I know of at least two cases on Main Street where um, the developer backed off um, um, uh, special permit process through the council and decided to go with a three-story building instead of a four-story building because they didn't want to take the time uh, going back and forth so it is a, a strong disincentive if um, you know obviously as of right would be the 
most flexible and most streamlined process. Um, still requires a public hearing, but it's a site plan public hearing instead of a special permit. The next up in difficulty would be a special permit in front of the planning board. So that would still require a, a public hearing for the special permit and conditions, but it wouldn't have to go back and forth between the two uh, bodies. And then the next one would be a special permit before the, uh, before the council. And the final one, I think, uh, the hardest one to go through is, uh, is the overlay process, which is what it currently is, because then you have to ask for a rezoning change, which is, you know, can be turned down as of right over any minor issue, whereas at least a, if it's a special permit, there's a specific list of, of conditions you have to meet, and if you meet the conditions, um, it's harder to turn them down. So that's sort of the, the layers that you get into the process once you require special permits or overload, uh, overlays rezoning. I mean, it sounds like that's kind of how, I mean, the, what you just described is kind of how I would like to see the process work, um, which is to, is to have these projects um, be unimpeded uh, in our high density areas and for the city to have extra time to scrutinize the projects when they're being proposed outside of the dense areas. Well, you, you also should remember that anybody can go to the linkage district, the waterfront development district, the central main street district right now without calling it a senior housing and, and propose multifamily apartments. Um, so it doesn't give you those great advantages um, in, in, um, in those three districts. But those are zoned to be high density. Exactly. But so, in the, I'm saying, what the saying is if, if the point is to encourage affordable senior housing, uh, there's no impediment right now in the linkage district or the Main Street district. Um, but there is in other districts. Um, so if, you, if the goal is to um, encourage these, um, you want to um, make the process as inviting as possible so mm -hmm. that people really consider uh, putting together a project that meets the, uh, the conditions of the code. This is going to sound a little off topic, um, but bear with me. Um, so we've been talking about transportation plan, kind of relating to Dan's concern there. And that concern has grown for me this week. Um, hearing from one of our residents who um, is no longer able to get around like she used to and we are not participating in the dial a ride um, through Dutchess County um, so so I'm, I have concerns there I'd like I'd like to hear what anyone else knows about that I haven't I haven't called Dutchess County to talk about it I've just looked on their website and confirmed that we're not listed um, but what it brought up for me is not only a concern for this um, neighbor of mine and other neighbors who might be in a similar situation, but just in terms of taking a step back and thinking about um, what people might want and need. Um, and not just in terms of how these developments might go up in a field somewhere and, and be difficult to get to and from Main Street, but also with the broader <laughs> affordable housing question, you know, um, there are just a lot of ways we could go with um, the list of recommendations that you put out there, John. I mean, Paloma's um, idea about an affordable housing overlay is, um, I was very interested in that. Um, I'm very interested in the senior housing overlay as well, but in, in terms of the decision tree, where, where do we start engaging with the community more? I really want to hear what, um, what our aging beacon community thinks about you know, more dense, affordable senior housing, not in areas that are currently uh, zoned for density. Where does that fall in here, Nick? When do we, you know, is there a public hearing in this list somewhere or do, because there are a lot of questions for us to get through together. Understood, I think the, the appropriate, the, the time that you would generally hear is after you have a proposal and you've introduced a local law, then you would hold a public hearing. 
So the council would first come up with what is the policy. You would give staff direction. We would prepare that local law. You would workshop the local law. And then when you're comfortable with it, you would then um, send that to the planning board and you could and you would also schedule a public hearing. If you're looking for input sooner than that, you either get it during your public comment or you could hold a community segment or a hearing just asking for those comments on that issue. I don't think residents have been shy about providing you with their comments. And certainly I know they watch the meeting minutes, videos. Yeah, and there's a lot of talk in the community about affordable housing, and there's a lot of talk in the community about senior affordable housing, and I, you know, I would really love to hear what people have to say directly. So on, on where we would allow and where we would require a permit, um, again, I, what I would like to do is define criteria. So, you know, for instance, we, we have a special use permit for historic overlay. Um, we used to have that come to the council. We now have it go to the uh, planning board. They still have criteria, uh, but the view was that it was both simpler for the planning board to handle the whole thing and also probably more uh, effective in terms of reducing the cost. And so the criteria um, is usually one of fit. And that kind, of, kind of what I'm hearing is there's a fit question. So if, if uh, looking at your spectrum, if we think there's a fit issue in terms of certain areas, um, then I, I would think we would do that. I, I don't see a reason why the council should uh, undertake that because a fit question is pretty objective. Um, you know, you can argue, you know, if someone's, you know, yells loud enough or, or has enough people come or, or doesn't have enough people come, there isn't an issue. But oftentimes fit can be defined by things like, you know, parking concerns or, um, you know, size of lot or other things. And so it seemed to me that we could define something that would be specific enough where we could say, you know, we could uh, have the planning board take a uh, lead on that. Yeah, I think it's a little more complicated than that. It's narrowness of streets, sidewalks, how many how many houses are, or how many cars are with each house and like there's some streets in Beacon where you know you can't add, <clears throat> you can't add anything else to that street you know because the street's so narrow and people can barely back out of their driveways but that might not be captured in like an objective study done by the developers um, uh, traffic person you know like they might be trying to I don't know I, I was I always kind of doubt a little bit the contractors that are hired by the developers <laughs> um, to critique their projects but um, I, I think that uh, having elected officials um, who are familiar with the neighborhoods and who are willing to walk around those neighborhoods and talk to folks about what they think of senior housing in their, on their street is a, is a good thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be much of a time, con it's going to consume much time either. Well, so again, the examples that you raise point me to, um, I can specify criteria. So you said narrowness of street. I mean, if we said, um, there's a minimum lot size of a half an acre that would actually exclude probably you know 40% of the lots maybe 80% of the lots in Beacon to begin with so I think you could start addressing it by by actually having criteria I, I get that you know you may want to have a say in the matter but it also opens the door for uh, non-objective viewpoints and I'm just not sure that um, we want to say you know we're always the best decider but rather that if we can't specify criteria, maybe we don't know what we want. I don't mean to derail the decision tree, but also there was, um, for the half an acre, John was gonna give us the, yep. what those were. Yep. Yeah, so that's, that's exciting. <laughs> Any, anything on that, John? I, I know you've been out for a little while, so. Yeah, I, I had a death in the family, so I've been out of commission for the last two weeks um, dealing with that and so I didn't get to that uh, the one thing I did add to the decision tree is that you could uh, put a limit on the um, distance from one of the major bus route thoroughfares so that it wasn't in the back country uh, neighborhoods or the up the mountain or um, you know, on the smaller streets it would be within so many feet of, a, of either Main Street Fishkill or um, Walcott, for instance. Yeah, but again, to Dan's point, you know, you can be actually on Fishkill and not get your wheelchair down the sidewalk. 
So, and we know that because we watch the wheelchairs go into the streets on, you know, fish kill on the end that we're not going to be making it to. So, it's tricky, even in the areas where we do have density. Well, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Although, I think offering people choice um, would help, helps the puzzle out, right? I mean, if, if you're someone who doesn't want to have a vehicle, then you don't want to choose a place that is off Main Street. And if you are a senior who, you know, um, wants to be close, then you look in those facilities. So having a variety of facilities would help the process along. Because there's other ones who are just, especially if we alter the age limitation, who are just empty nesters and have, you know, a number of years that they could um, be pretty ambulatory, may prefer uh, further away because they can. And they may choose later on to move closer in because, again, they decide that's the time that they want it. So having choice might be a good thing. I, I, I'm not sure, um, sorry, there are a lot of um, pieces of this puzzle that we've sort of opened up, um, but just to address the last one, um, I think that the providing choice is hypothetically um, an excellent option, but the reality is that um, our vacancy rate and options are such that choice is um, not actually an option for anybody, and I realize that that is the underlying purpose of what we're doing here, is that we're trying to build more units so that people do ultimately have that choice. Um, but I think what that illustrates a little bit to me is that um, and part of why I am struggling to um, find an end to this conversation is that I feel like it is overall a little bit cart before the horse to me. We're making decisions about which tool to use, but um, I feel like we, uh, we've, we decided we want to build more housing, um, but we haven't really decided the middle parts of it. Um, you know, we could put um, these decisions about um, where we want to build it, if it's close to transportation or not. We could put that in the criteria for, to put in front of the planning board. We could put that in the criteria to put in front of ourselves. Um, but to me, I don't want to make that decision about who we're putting that decision in front of until we know what those criteria are, if that makes sense. Um, and so I'm, I'm I think I'm having a hard time committing to the idea of a senior affordable housing overlay, not because I don't think that we need um, housing for seniors, and but because um, I feel like we're having the conversation around the edges and not at the heart of it. Um, and I'm not sure how to shift us there. Um, I think that we had, we had started talking two weeks ago about returning to the um, Dutchess County um, report, which gave us a 10,000 square uh, foot view, which is maybe zooming too far out. Um, I don't think so, but I could see that argument. Um, and I, I think I, I would be more engaged in this conversation if what we were talking about was um, sort of setting forward more of um, what we're trying to accomplish here and for who, um, as opposed to uh, the nitty gritty of the operationalizing of the policy that we, I don't think that we've clearly defined what we're doing. If I may respond just to the um, cart before the horse in relation to the, um, the housing study. So what happened after the housing study that I did not present on yet, but I can touch on a little bit now is there was a discussion about how um, how we work the plan and the data in our respective communities in Dutchess County which need very different things and there are ideas about what's um, next in terms of figuring out what's next which would be like um, community voice sessions or a task force or something you mentioned once Ploma was a um, housing roadmap so to approach the issues more broadly and you know there there are just so many different ways we could go we we certainly want to try to do the low-hanging fruit sure and everything 
you know, if everyone agrees on senior affordable housing and we can do that and make it more, you know, we can quickly move quickly to make it to open up that um, opportunity for our community, great. Um, but <coughs> missing the opportunity to find out from Beacon, you know, what do Beacon, <laughs> what do Beacon firefighters think? What do our school teachers think? We know that the best schools are the communities where teachers can afford to live there. We know that there's a lot of, we know from the study that there's a lot of housing um, in, in certain quintiles and not other quintiles, and they differ based on, you know, whether they're renters or owners, and we can go through all of that data again. I have it right here. Um, so yeah, maybe presenting that information again and, and addressing your concern about cart before the horse is something we should consider. So uh, I'm listening, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we how do we work this. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, John, you put a, a list together. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, after reading some books and some meetings, I, I put a list together, and, and they may not amount to a roadmap, right? And so, um, does the county? You know, I know they did the study. Does the county have like a proposed? set of changes that in some order, in other words, do they have something more like a roadmap? And can we learn that? Do we know? The consultants on this study did recommend um, certain things, and, and this is sort of one of them, is looking at what zoning laws we can change to make more affordability happen. Um, now, but again, after the county did the study, then there was another consultant that came in to talk about how to engage the community and what the community needs. Um, because community buy-in is just so important for affordable housing. We see it all over. The issue isn't that there aren't affordable housing options. The issue is that matching the options to the community is hard to do because there's all often pushback. Um, so, um, you know, the report talked about voucher programs. The talk, it talked about um, home ownership initiatives. It talked about um, building more housing for 50,000 or less, I think was the first recommendation. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So um, it sounds like, and I, I, I think we're struggling a little bit, right? Um, mm -hmm. So maybe there's some preliminary stuff we should be doing, like take a review of the study, see if the county has someone who can come talk to us about what a roadmap might look like. Uh, or about how we get, um, you know, community input. Um, so that preliminary to doing something, we do something that kind of gives us kind of a higher level view of where we're heading. I, again, I'm just trying to listen to the conversation. I don't know the answer. I'm just proposing ideas. I, I'm also wondering, Mayor, if this is worth, and part of me is like, oh, this sounds like it's just bureaucracy, so you slow it down, but actually if we want a committee in the city that's not the city council to look at housing issue, a bit like with, when we did the police advisory committee, so we could really drill down on that expertise, and is it something where if John has capacity to help with that committee, and then that committee comes back with proposals, look, like I'm like spending this time looking at random parcel access maps of like, we have a whole bunch of property along South Avenue that's well above 0.5 acres. Do we want a bunch of senior housing along South? I don't, I don't know, and so I feel like I'm not well informed to make that decision and don't want our community to feel like we're making a decision without that their input in the fully informed, so maybe a committee, even if it slows us down. Now, having said that, if the county and their, you know, their DMV parcel comes to us and is like, hey, we have this money, we want to do it now, then the council might be like, there's an immediate desire for us to do something. I'm not, or the MTA, I'm not seeing that at this immediate time, and so I feel like we might have some time to do this properly to create a roadmap, um, either ourselves or with the county or a conjunction, so. Uh, yes, because like you, I'm also feeling like, ooh, I don't know what the right thing is. Seniors sounds good, affordable sounds good, but I don't know what the next combination of steps are. Well, I mean, we don't have to get too complicated. We could do a middle road version, but I mean, we could have a, one where the council has a conversation about the things that we want to achieve, right? Like, I've, I've heard at least four people here say that they want to build more housing for $40,000 or le for people making $50,000 or less. So we know that that's something that the council would want to do. So if we just talk through a bunch of different ideas, do we want 
housing that's uh, specific by profession? Do we want housing that's specific by age range? Do we want to protect housing that's affordable now? Do we want to create new affordable housing? What kind of affordable housing? Those are simple questions that we can answer as a group, and then we can use those to create the policy roadmap. But we haven't really had a, a conversation, and when I say we, I, I mean, apologize, I haven't participated in the last two, um, but I haven't heard a consensus on really what we're trying to do on affordable housing generally. And I mean, my, I have been focused on the $50,000 number, admittedly, because <clears throat> that's above Section 8, and it's below, and it's, and it's what the county is recommending. Um, so I've been kind of stuck on the 50,000 number, admittedly. But I think that we have to have, I think we can iron out some of the objectives if we're not talking about the policy. And we're not talking about special use permits and whatever other things we're talking about. You know, if we just focus on what do we want to achieve, you know, do we want more artist housing? Is that the thing? You know, what are the things? Well, I also think we have to be careful about what we want versus what we can actually do. Mm -hmm. um, if we're looking for people with $50,000, we can't do that. The city can't do that. That involves state, federal funds. Well, I mean, just as a um, as a policy objective, not as like the city is going to build housing. I meant just that. Do we think that there should be more of it? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure everyone would agree. I think what, and I, I I mean, I agree with what we're discussing here is maybe we're putting this in front before we really know what the community wants. Um, part of if we were to reach out to the community, part of reaching out to the community is is being very clear about what we can control and what we can do. Mm -hmm. I think what John uh, uh, is presenting here is what can we do immediately which might have an impact without seeking state or federal subsidies. So I think that's, that's why they're, they're suggesting this because it's an easy one mm -hmm. and it's almost a low hanging fruit. The senior affordable? The senior, yeah. senior yeah. affordable overlay. Um, we're eliminating the overlay. So I think that's why it's being presented but I also agree that we do need to reach out to the community um, and see what they're thinking about. <laughs> So I'm still hearing the first step is come back to the county study, right? Because <coughs> we're, we're kind of picking up data from there. I think that's the first presentation that we should do. Uh, and it sounds like the follow-up would be, and does the county have any next steps that they have associated now that they did that study? That could be. I mean, are you picturing just my doing my presentation again? Because I... I I worry that the county, I don't know if the county has anything new or if they might already say, you know, we have provided your community, with, I'm sure they would come, yeah. but they've given us a lot of tools already to move forward and, and some of it maybe just bears reminding the council of, you know, I could do it right now, but I don't want to keep everyone. But, well, we also you know. haven't all reviewed it. Um, yeah. Uh, John, maybe you can give us some advice here. Um, but, but just real quick, I, I think that Molly's idea of the committee also looking at the tools that the county has provided us again i don't know if that might be yeah. the first or the second step i'm not sure um so so john nick we we've obviously uh, deviated from the senior um, housing overlay memo um, any advice you might offer us uh, in terms of trying to get um, kind of a high level view before we dig down and I keep looking at the county study as the starting point. Do you think that they would come and present it to us? Do you think that you know um, we can just you know review it and have Ren take us through it? Do you think that they would have someone who might have sort of what what's the game plan now that the study's done? What do you think? I I think you if you reached out to the county, they certainly would come down and do a presentation, and uh, they may have. Um, new information that's come in from the rental housing survey or some other source since then that that study is a year old now um so i would advise that i mean i i know you want to get into the big picture but uh, when we started this over a year ago um it was about urgency and the, the low-hanging fruit the things you could do fast to have an impact and it, the time the accessory apartments was the easiest thing to do supposedly and then the senior housing was the next in line because those could have big impacts and only involve changes in an existing zoning law uh, to make them more flexible and and um, more available so um, you could operate on three fronts you could um, go forward with say the senior housing overlay as the next easiest thing to do and second um 
follow up with the county. I actually met with the county commissioner, planning commissioner, on the um, on the, the county center possibility. Um, so I do have some stuff I could report on that. So you could uh, work on a particular project that seems to have promise to do something relatively soon. And then the third thing is you could broaden the conversation and have a committee or a council discussion or a public information hearing uh, to get ideas about where to go thereafter. And because that, you know, if you set up a committee, it's going to be a six months, a year until you get any sort of um, um, sort of plan of action. Uh, I'd hate to waste another year while people are in trouble. Yeah, I agree there is great urgency here and um, I, if, if the council and our administration thinks it's possible to move forward on three different fronts at once, then I think that sounds great to me, um, but I also, you know, that's not up to me alone. And, and, and I think what this discussion shows and what we're starting to learn and observe is that, and you've seen this in the governor's housing compact, is that one of the barriers to housing, right, is the lack of that housing, not having a sufficient quantity as communities grow, but then also does zoning become that barrier? And how do you work to make sure that zoning serves that purpose of protecting the character of a community that you want while also allowing for the growth? And at the end of the day, this all comes down to the density. What amount of density are you comfortable allowing and where? And maybe that needs to be one of your focal discussion points because you can allow senior affordable, you can have affordable housing, but you need to determine that you are comfortable with allowing more housing and more units within certain areas of the city. And then also the reality is if it's going to get built, how do you make sure that the development community or the funding is there to encourage and allow it to be built and that it will be well received by the community? I think those are some of the fundamental issues that many communities face as they start to look at their zoning in a, in a new light. How do we have that discussion? I want to have that one. <laughs> I'd say over a couple of beers, but. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me make the motion. So, uh, let me propose the next step of, of bringing the county in, right? Let's, let's make that happen. Because there's a bunch of questions that we can ask them since the study. Like, you know, they've got a fund now. And they've actually awarded some some dollars and understanding what are their criteria what are they looking for um, you know how do we compare to other communities I mean those are all questions I think would be helpful and which will go past the study itself um, that they may have started thinking through so can I propose that as our, our next one try to bring them in in a couple of weeks and See if that will help us get that picture. And if Heather Lavarnier is still there, that would be amazing because since Anne is gone, Heather was there through the whole process. I don't. I know there's seniority, and you have to, you know, ask who you ask. But I yep. would put in a recommendation for Heather. Okay. Yeah. And Heather's still there. Okay, great. And I just want to reiterate that I think it's important that um, we get both those uh, policy recommendations, but also their recommendations about how to engage the community. Um, we had set today at one point as the launch of a community quarterly about housing, but um, we clearly aren't ready for that, which I think is fine. Um, but I do want to make sure that we are continuing our commitment to engaging the community in a conversation. But to George's point, we don't want to open the door uh, to a conversation that we aren't prepared um, to have and to end up trying to promise things that are not actually possible. Um, so would really love their guidance on, on that as well. Okay, that sounds right. Everybody good if we take that as the next step? I, I know that wasn't quite where we were heading, but that's <laughs> kind of what we're hearing, right? Yep. Okay, that'd be great. Um, so we'll get back to you. We're going to see if we can get them in a couple of weeks. And it might be an, another, you know, one after that. So let us see what we can find. Hey, John, um, let's talk afterwards, uh, Chris, about talking to the county and see what we learn. But we'll we'll take that up. All right. And maybe just say, you know, to the public that's listening tonight, if you have ideas about affordable housing and what's important to you, um, and what ideas you have for uh, for affordable housing policy, to come to a city council meeting and let us know, or send us an email. Okay, um, thank you all, and again, we'll, we'll get there. This is a, a really, really big topic. Getting our arms around it is not straightforward. Um, uh, last one is on leaf blower regulations, which we've um, you know, uh, put off a couple of times. Nick, did you wanna take us through something there? 
Well, Mayor, what I really think where we left, last left off of this, we had had a decision tree, and there were a number of questions, and I think it all reverted back to the council needing to speak amongst yourselves and come with what were your policy objectives. You had the um, CAC's memo, that's included in the packet. I think the council wanted to review that memo, and you wanted to see where you were going with that, because I think there was some thoughts that, is this something that is necessary now? Is that something that is perhaps it's going to be self-regulating as the state enters this um, conversation and is it prudent for a city the size of Beacon? Or is this something that you know needs to be on your agenda now given other issues and also that if you were to adopt any type of regulation, it would not take effect uh, during this season? And I think Dan had some questions and had asked that the CAC memo be included in the packet and we had, um, and so it's included in the packet. So really, um, it's for, I'm happy to guide the discussion, but it's really up for the council to sort of determine how it wants to proceed with this issue. So just to correct that thought, I, I had, um, I don't think that I participated in a workshop uh, since the law was drafted. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I, the draft that I saw, I liked um, and didn't have any questions, but somebody else was asking about the gasoline versus electric which prompted uh, that somebody, and I don't remember the conversation, to be honest, I watched it on video after that happened, but somebody asked for, to review the CAC memo, to see about gas versus electric. Um, but I, I thought the law was, was kind of on the money, and um, the, my only objection to it was that I, and, and perhaps I haven't carefully read it, that I thought that the um, seasonal regulation was going to be a stepping stone to the permanent regulation, which had been the recommendation of the CAC. And my, I, my recollection of the law that it was only the seasonal regulation, but I could be wrong. I think I was, so, sorry, Nick, you can go ahead. No, go ahead, Justice. Okay, I think I was the one that asked us to hold off on this because I think where we were at, uh, the law was getting ready, or not law, but it was getting ready to go to public hearing and take effect immediately. And one of the CAC's recommendations was to do an educational period first. And I feel like the law, or what it was, as what it was, was presented to us, didn't have all of the CAC's recommendations uh, implemented in it. So I thought that we should go back and review it first, and then we just haven't had the opportunity to review it with you because this is something that you're passionate about and we want to make sure that it is. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm passionate about it, but I'm responding to some constituent needs. Yeah. I've never really thought much about these floors before. The, the, we received some correspondence a while ago from, um, so, uh, I think, a landscaper. Do we still have that? I'd like to, this, there was some, he had some I, numbers I, and statistics in there as well regarding gas versus uh, electric. This, was this the gentleman that had come in? That he did came yeah, in. Yeah, Junis Sela, who's a, a local resident, and he has a landscaping business, mm -hmm. and he's really concerned about this, the impact of this on his business. And, and I believe in, in that correspondence, he had some, I think, some f facts or about the sounds about sounds that might contradict even what you know. Everyone can come up with stats and numbers and so on. I just I don't know necessarily who to believe, but I. Um, I, I take that side seriously as well because it's, it will have an impact on small businesses. <clears throat> I, I want to say I'm really concerned about the enforceability of this. Um, we had talked about there are, there are people that run these companies and there are people that work for these companies. If somebody's using a leaf blower, the person using the leaf blower gets the ticket even if it's a person that doesn't control the means and methods of their own employment, they get the ticket. So I, I've, I, again, it's like when we have a noise ordinance, um, the, the entity that, that enforces that is, is usually the police department. So we've had a broad conversation about, well, we should be not doing this or doing that with police. I'm, I'm concerned that our police You've asked them to do a lot, like to you know, upgrade their enforcement of traffic laws in certain areas. They've been doing that. We continue to have minimum shifts of four people. We're lucky if we have five, and then I can actually put somebody walking Main Street. 
I, I'm concerned about them having to arbitrate this. If you have a, a lot size, for instance, are they going to have to look up what the lot size is before they issue a ticket? Half the time, by the time they get there, somebody's going to be in and out with this thing. I can imagine, I saw our crews using a leaf blower today to clean the sidewalks. And I'm sure people are going to not distinguish between, oh, we have a leaf blower law, but it exempts public workers. Yeah, and I've, I'm really uncomfortable with that, to be honest. I'm uncomfortable yeah. with this whole thing. Yeah, I am. Because I don't think you want to send police to give tickets to low-income workers because they're using a tool of their trade. And, and again, I, I get, like... I don't know, if you're going to go after sound, why don't we go after the jazzed up cars and the motorcycles that, that make M Main Street almost unwalkable when they go by? Well, we have, there are laws on the books about those. I, I, I get that, Dan, but there's also a constraint about how much enforcement. You want to you add this to the plate, tell me what you want to take off the plate. So, so you're saying um, that we can't introduce any more laws that require police? No, I'm no, just so saying this. On, you on. can't. You can't do a law that doesn't make any sense. So hang on. Having a on. law that's like, okay, for these hours and that hours, and then we're going to give a ticket to the guy who has no control over his employment. So let me um, just add well, my own two cents. I've been I've been hearing uh, questions about this because it's lingered for some time. I'm I'm hearing them in both directions. So I'm a little concerned that we're over-regulating here. Um, you know, it's one thing if we say there's a season that it's usable and a season that it's not. It's one thing to say there's hours that you can use them and hours that you can't. Um, you know, if we just want to use the noise ordinance, we could use that. But I'm just a little reluctant to go too much further. Um, in particular, I'm concerned um, with the comment that George made about, well, the city's exempted and, and nobody else is, or, you know, certain people over a lot size are. Yeah, it seems to also favor someone with a big lot as opposed yeah. to someone who has does. a tiny little lot. Yeah. So someone with a five-acre lot, they're exempt. But that's because the the noise is further away from people. Not, not I mean, necessarily. They could, could use right. a but regular it could be. property but it, sure, line and you could yeah. have, you know, yeah. top topography that has that sound carrying a long way. Yeah. It just, it, it seemed, what, what I saw coming through was going to be really tough to enforce. Um, so is there a, is the law in our packet? No. It's not, right? Um, no. Yeah, because I, I just wanted to get another read of it again. Um, but again, I, as I said, I, I just have kind of gr have growing, have grown in concern in this area. Uh, since it first came up, and I, I would prefer a less restrictive way to kind of affect um, noise control. I mean, we talked about having very low fines. We talked about it being seasonal. We talked about it, like, if there be a, a fair warning. I mean, I don't know how that's over-regulating. I think we're paring the regulation back quite a bit. I think we're trying to change behavior as opposed to blasting everybody with tickets, right? Well, but And I thought that's where we moved the law toward. Yeah, it's also saying that this particular device is no longer acceptable. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, I don't think we have very much information as to, um, you know, who owns one, who doesn't, you know, how easy is it to replace? I mean, I, I go into my, you know, local hardware place that I go to, and everything that's for sale that they're advertising is the um, battery ones right now. And so maybe it's a problem that's solving itself. I Again, I'm just... A little reluctant to overregulate here, and I've had a, that landscaper came in who I know met with at least two of you, and I've spent hours on the phone with him. He's really upset because he feels like you're going to put him out of business. Mm -hmm. Now, you all should go talk to him before you do this law, because I'm done talking to him. I I told him I'm not voting on this. You go talk to the people that are voting on it. And I think, Dan, you should talk to him. You, you got a small business in town. He relies on this technology. The way he explains it, he comes in and does a small lot. They're in and out of there in 10 minutes. By the time somebody called the cops, they're probably gone. I, I know our guy went, going down the street was, was in and out of there in like two minutes. You know, because they're, they're very effective in getting, getting things moved quickly. I just think you're going to, I think you should talk to the small businesses that are in the city that you're going to impact before you decide that's a big issue. I haven't had a single 
complaint about a leaf blower in two and a quarter years, but I have heard a lot of complaints about traffic, and I'd rather assign the limited police time we have to, th to things that are probably more important to more people, like traffic and speeding and... On the enforcement issue, I thought the last conversation we had was that the building department could be a part of it. Was that not... Was that not the case that the building? How department? does the building department do that? I mean, on the hours that you, how we, do they do? We, how do they do? Whether you have we, they don't. They don't enforce. Or? They don't enforce noise ordinances. Okay. Was that yeah. Nick? Or yeah. Well, I was just going to say the building department also is not there twenty four seven. So when you get these on the weekends, for example, it would be up to the police to enforce. I, I just think it's ironic that you don't want police doing certain things and now you want to send police to give tickets. They are going to give tickets because if somebody doesn't put this, let, play this out. Somebody says, no, I can use this, then they're going to ticket them. If they don't stop, they are going to be fined. How did um, the 30 days to remediate come in with the police department then? We were talking about how they had a 30-day warning to stop using the leaf blower. I, I don't I, remember I, that conversation I, yeah, at all. Yeah, I apologize. I, I don't have the legislation in front of me, so. But, uh, but I do I know that really the legislation got kind of patched together at the end when Drew was on their way out the door. And, and that last meeting was like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then all of a sudden we saw this, this law that it was like, well, this isn't even consistent with the CAC memo. Um, can I ask the following, which is can, can we at least get the um, proposed law in front of us? Because, again, I, I keep hearing stuff that... I'm no longer familiar with, and it's not in the past. Which, which iteration of the proposed law? So the last one? Whatever the last, the last one. latest one is, yeah. All right, because it's just hard to talk it through without the specifics in front of us. And I'd also, if someone could provide that letter from that contractor. Um, I, I will provide all of his stuff, including his contact information, okay. and please talk to him. Yeah. Dan, do you have a sense of what the, um, the aim was of the law? Like what people were, uh, had concerns of? Was it about noise? Noise was related to So the noise was migraine. the main thing. Headaches. And my understanding, not to say it is currently enforceable because of the reality of our police department and getting there, but I assume leaf blowers are already above our daytime limits or does it depend on where they are on the property? I, I recall, I have to look at, but I believe we exempted garden uh, lawn equipment. Okay, so right now they are exempted. Right. I'm not saying that we would want to just say they're no longer exempted because enforcement might still be an issue, but if it, I, I'm just curious because they, the electric versus gas part, I just wanted to be clear what we're trying to regulate and not to say that there might, that the gas ones might not be more harmful in some ways, but is this something we want to also incorporate into so the law? I, I think the gas ones are a preemption issue with respect to regulating gas powered emissions that under the Clean Air Act, the federal government has preserved, reserved to itself the ability to regulate engines. So you can't regulate gas powered leaf blowers based upon air emission concerns. But in addition to that, the CAC, while they said that gas-powered uh, leaf blowers are louder, they said as battery technology is evolving, the, leaf, the electric leaf blowers are also getting louder. So it's kind of like the yeah, leaf that's, that's why I'm, the loudness. Yes, that and Nick's point, I'm like, ooh, trying to understand exactly what we want to regulate and how, assuming we might want to get a version of this mm -hmm. law. So thank you. And under your current noise ordinance, section 149-8, letter A, is an exemption. Sounds from power tools used for landscaping, lawn mowers, and garden equipment when operated during daytime hours. Thanks, Nick. You're welcome. So, yes, we'll work with Chris and provide you with that information. Okay. Anything else on this one? And again, I apologize, but I, I just feel like I need the thing in front of me. I just. We're, we're digging into it. Yeah, I'm not um, responding to the legislation because I also don't have it in front of me, but um, just the whole idea in general, um, what, I, what I liked about the discussion was um, I, I liked the CAC's recommendations as they were presented. I think they were presented to us. And I was compelled by the grid of other communities who... Um, you know, I, I've just watched some of those communities and their commitment to an environmentalism, and I know that, you know, broad strokes, right? I'm not, I'm not using the GAS word, but I'm just saying that, you know, in this vision that we have, or that some of us have of Beacon as an environment, 
environmentally friendly, affordable city. It's, um, you know, I, I, like, I like the direction that, and those other communities that committed, that have committed to um, raising awareness, which I, I do see it as, as an awareness raise, raising kind of issue. Um, those communities have big lawns, but still are, are committing to um, an environmentalist approach. So. I will also say, and this is me reading between the lines, and this is not every Westchester community, that it's mainly Westchester, and it mainly happened post-pandemic, and it was mainly framed in news reports that themselves have their opinion. It's about people who affluence have started working from home and didn't like the noise. And that's why there was huge support for them. So that framing of it in multiple communities makes me a little questioning about, is it really environmental? Is that really the main driving factor? And is it really the discussion here today about what is affordability? Who are we saying afford it? Who gets these tickets? How do people afford equipment? I don't think as a city we probably don't have the funds to support any changes in equipment. And so I would want to, us to really dig into it once we have a copy of the law. OK for this evening? All right. OK. Um, all right, we have some to-dos. We didn't resolve everything on the docket, um, but we'll get to it. And um, that's all there is for this evening. Anything else? OK. I'm going to have my cupcake. <laughs> Thank you all. Well, happy birthday and good night. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>